So, where is the political center in the Philippines? And what role should it play in the democratic project? In our three-episode search, we have followed different guides with different perspectives. First, the perspective of political journalism with a strong historical element. And second, the perspective of political science. Last week, Professors Aris Arugay of UP and Carmel Aba of Ateneo de Manila converged on the idea that today, the political center must be understood as a pro-democratic plurality animated by reformist values. In the last stretch of our search, we will use the lens of actual political practice. How do politicians understand the center? Good evening. I'm John Neri, and you are in the public square. I am delighted to say that we are joined tonight by a political practitioner par excellence. The distinguished former Senator Sergio Osmeña III has won election to the Senate three times and served in the Senate for a full 18 years. But he is also widely considered an expert in Philippine electoral politics, who many other politicians up to today continue to count on for his astute election advice. Thank you, Senator Serge Osmeña, for joining us in the public square. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, let me start by asking you, does the political center have an electoral value? Do you win national elections if you appeal to the center in the Philippines? I do not know what you mean by center. Uh, so, you do you have to explain to me what the center is because I don't know what that means. Okay. Uh, that's a very practical response, sir. Sir, you've been an important member of at least three political parties, the Christian Democrats, and you see the, and then Lakas, and you see the, then the Liberal Party for a few years, then the PDP Laban. But you've also run for office, for instance, in 2010, when you won your third Senate race, as a political independent. What does the center mean for you? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything, because I don't know what you mean. The, no. The, let, let me pick it up from there. Okay. Talking about the center, people talk about the middle. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the middle of what? The center of what? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're talking about uh, the normal way of looking at things, which is uh, through the, you know, shall, shall, shall we say, the left, right, and center, mm -hmm. in other words, you're conservative or you're liberal, or you're communist, I don't think that that is the way we should be looking at things. Because mm -hmm. while you may have that in place, you'll be out of tune with everybody else. Now, I think what you're probably looking for is where is the mass going to be to achieve appeal to the voter? Mm -hmm. to vote for you? Where is that mass going to be? And that mass right now, I believe, is in the B and E vote. Forget the A, B, C vote. Okay. You, you can argue until you're blue in the face. You can argue about rightist policies or leftist policies, mm -hmm. but you won't get the massa to back you up. So it's really useless. What you should do is find out what does the massa want and go there and give it to them. That is the political center mm -hmm. as you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that center is not a center in, in the sense that tama ka, my left, my right, my center. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. To me, that is the meat of the problem. When, when uh, our politicians go uh, on efforts to exercise their vote, to exercise their, their, their free will, they always forget that what is the poor looking for? Mm -hmm. It's not the rich, it's the poor. And unless we have that, unless we grab that, we're not going to make sense out of anything. Now, in the latest survey, the latest survey of the, the president and the vice president. Mm -hmm. 
Pulse Asia. Mm -hmm. Inflation is the biggest problem of the poor. Mm -hmm. It's inflation. So 76% disagree with the way the president is handling the inflation problem. That's where the center is. That's where the Middle East. But what I understand you saying is that the political center... No, no, no. It's going to be hard to understand this because I'm coming from a different direction. No, but, uh, actually, uh, this is really the design of this three-episode search. Uh, Senator, I wanted to end uh, by talking to an actual politician or a recently retired one. Um, I, I wanted to test the concepts that we found in the first couple of episodes and see whether they stand uh, Philippine election reality. Uh, so this, this idea of uh, appealing to the masa, um, sir, let me just go back a bit in history. When Marcos declared martial law, he called constitutional authoritarian, uh, authoritarianism a revolution from the center. And then when uh, Ninoy Aquino returned in 1983, Senator Soc Rodrigo remembered appealing to him to come back because the democratic center needed a leader. Um, before we talk about uh, uh, politics today, sir, um, may I have your take on what they thought they were uh, uh, saying when they used the terms revolution from the center or the democratic center? Yeah, th that's, what, that's, all, that's all they were talking about. Mm -hmm. There's the left, there's the right, and there's the center. Okay. And, and, and that's very artificial to me okay. because people don't believe in that in this country. Mm -hmm. What they're concerned about is their food. What they're concerned about is their yeah. jobs. Okay. What they're concerned about is inflation. Mm -hmm. And this is something that about 95%, even 99% of our people care about. So that's where we have to concentrate. That, to me, is mm -hmm. the middle. That okay. is the, call it the center, that is the center to me. All right. Sir, the... Uh Appeal of political independence. No? So you've run as a political independent. I think Kiko Pangilinan ran as a political independent in 2004. Grace Poe in 2016, I think, or so. Um, is that a way of uh, turning your back on these uh, terms, left, right, center, and you know, just uh, putting yourself uh, in front of the electorate? Uh, in other words, it's a post-ideological uh, strategy for elections? I, I don't understand your question. When you uh, ran as a political ind independent, uh, what were the advantages for you uh, having made that decision? I think uh, in 2010, you still enjoyed the support of uh, a political party, but you did not join their sorties and, and so on. Um, this positioning... <laughs> The political party was really non-existent. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, in this country, people join forces just for that election, then they split up again. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really non-existent. Uh, in, in the Senate, you have to have your base. If you don't have your base, you're not going to get anywhere. Now, for example, look at the, uh, the results of the last elections. Mm -hmm. Robin Padilla didn't have a party, mm -hmm. he's number one. Tulfo didn't have a party, he's number two, etc., etc. In other words, parties are only good for show, but you have to have your own base. The, 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 there's no such thing as a party here. Parties are just uh, conveniences. Mm -hmm. They're conveniences for the politicians to join together so that they can get something. This is Congress. Mm -hmm. Now, in the provinces, parties are different. They each have their own party. Yeah. So you cannot say that uh, I'm, I'm a liberal or I'm not a nationalist. I'm not a nationalist. I'm not a nationalist. I'm not a So uh, this is just a, a, a nature of you know alliances at the national level. But after that, it disappears. And right now, the party has disappeared. Mm -hmm. 
So you only have parties during election time. <laughs> then after election time, it disappears. Mm -hmm. So the, the concept of uh, left, right, center, uh, should we have a better appreciation for this? Or uh, that's really the Philippine reality? No? Uh, no. I have an appreciation for the left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. that's, that, there's no doubt about that. That goes on all over the world. Mm -hmm. In England, you have the conservatives, and mm -hmm. you have the liberals, and you have the Labour Party. In the United States, you've got the Democrats and the Republicans. So that's natural. But in this country, that is not natural anymore. Because we have corrupted the system so much that, you know, when you're in Congress, maghati-hati lang kayo dyan sa pork butter. That's right. And that, that's all they care about. They want to make hati-hati the pork barrel. And they want to win in their districts. And that's it. And we're not going to have that anywhere solving our problems. Two weeks ago, we had uh, Manolo Quezon uh, join us. And he suggested that Marcos learned something important from Richard Nixon, which is appealing to a silent majority. Uh, uh, Nixon won uh, re-election uh, despite the Watergate scandal by appealing to this silent majority of Americans who were disgusted by the Vietnam War protests, by the 60s uh, counterculture, and, and so on. And Quezon suggested that Marcos learned from Nixon uh, and essentially, for the first 10 years or so of martial law, that was the base of support for Marcos as dictator, the silent majority of Filipinos. Uh, and for him, for Quezon, that was the Philippine center at the time. Uh, would you agree with that uh, perspective, sir? I still didn't understand half your question, so I can't under uh, I can't comment on it. Let, let Do you me, like? Yeah, let me rephrase that. Uh, Marcos learned the concept of a silent majority uh, from Nixon. And Marcos was Marcos, part of a silent majority. Yes. That, that, well. He, he can pretend to do a lot of things, so mm -hmm. uh, this is one of his pretensions. There's no silent majority. There is no silent majority in the Philippines, sir? Um. No, no, there's no silent majority. They're all noisy, except that <laughs> when, 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 when they make noise, iba uh, iba. But the, uh, there is no silent majority. By silent, I mean that they agree with you, and disagree with you, mm -hmm. and they're silent. I doubt that. I doubt that very much. Now, the, the majority of the Philippines today seems to be okay with the way Marcos is running things. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. But still, if you're looking for the center, I don't know where, where that is. Ibang mm -hmm. ibang klase. Yes. I'm trying to square his idea of the silent majority uh, with your idea that essentially the center is uh, the masa. No? I mean that, and right now we're looking at uh, classes D and E, right? Uh, so I'm trying to, to see whether you, you're talking about the same thing but from the different aspects or there are different no. things altogether. Senator, martial law was difficult for you personally. You spent several years in jail. But there was very little dissent at that time in 1972 and uh, essentially through the 1970s. Would it be fair to characterize the public opinion at that time as supportive of Marcos? Yeah, well, you know, what happened there was that the majority of our people, you, you know, we... we you, 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 you cannot say that they're active. They're not active. That's right. If our people just tend to take things as they are. Mm -hmm. So, okay lang yan. Bapahala na, etc., etc. But that doesn't hide. That doesn't cover what they really feel inside. Now, if they had a way, they would 
show it, but they have no way. So what we have to do is make sure that they can find a way to show their feelings, to show their, um, shall, shall we say, reaction mm -hmm. to, the, to the various uh, movements that uh, the government wants or, or, or any politician wants. But you cannot say that uh, because the majority of the people did nothing, they were in agreement. They were not in agreement. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, um, in, look, du during the time of martial law, even, even now, uh, nowadays, you, you, you come out with one or two good things, mm -hmm. and then you blow it up. And if you control the media, Odi, maganda ka, guapo ka, di ba? And you hide things that are not uh, palatable, put it that way. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, in, during martial law, you had 70,000 uh, people who were detained. Mm -hmm. You had 3,000, 4,000 people who were murdered. You had all sorts of things going on. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the people were uh, ag agree in agreement with that. Mm -hmm. they, they could do nothing about it. That's why. I'm, I'm glad you raised the... Uh, element of the media, uh, Senator, I'd like to ask, now that media landscape has fragmented, uh, you don't have just three newspapers or two TV stations, uh, now you have social media and so on, how does that affect uh, appealing to the masa? Social media is important to, to those who use the phone. Mm -hmm. But those who don't use the phone, and many, uh, I think about 40% of our people don't use phones, and even the 30%, I mean, of the 70% who use phones, mm -hmm. about 60% or 70% of the 70% mm -hmm. use it all for kalakohans, like mm -hmm. texting friends and all that. Mm -hmm. They don't use it to learn about the issues in the world. Okay. So... It's really difficult to say, me, 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 cellphone siya, so medyo nakakaintindi ng, ng issues. Hindi po, hindi po ganun. Senator, uh, I'd like to ask your uh, opinion uh, about the following personalities. So I've asked uh, previous guests uh, about them. Um... Can you classify them, whether uh, uh, along the pol political spectrum, left, right, center, or uh, as uh, people with the uh, right combination uh, that will appeal? Uh, I, I wanted to find out if these people uh, are able to appeal to uh, uh, a national base of support. Now, so, for instance, uh, Senator Risa Ontiveros. I'll start with her. She's the first of five I'd like to ask you about. Uh, how yes. would you classify her, sir? Um, and fantastic. The, sorry, she's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that wasn't in my uh, li, uh, categories, but yes. Um, so the the fact, sir, that she's able to work across the uh, the aisles, so to speak, uh, even yeah. though belonging to a very small minority, uh, being like you, a very productive senator, um, would that help? Uh, us understand the concept of somebody who bridges different uh, uh, sectors and appeals to as many people as possible. Is that what uh, Senator Risa is? Uh, the fact that she's able to work even with uh, the administration and come up with uh, actual laws despite being in a very small minority. This ability to work across aisles. Um, is that something that appeals to the masa, do you think? Okay, I'm telling you something. The masa doesn't know what happens in the Senate. Okay. The masa doesn't know what happens in the House. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know how to answer that. Okay, no, that's, a, that's an answer okay. in itself. Those who know about Risa, mm -hmm. I think most people approve of Risa. Mm -hmm. But the rest, they don't know what she's doing. 
because they don't read about it. They don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, one, there's, there, there's still a dearth of news from, uh, about, about politics uh, to the outside world, to the Filipinos. And besides, they're so busy that they couldn't care less what's happening. Mm -hmm. Sir, how about... We have, that, that, that's why it's important to get that center. Mm -hmm. If you get that center where it hits them hard, then you'll get their attention. Sir, how about Stella Kimbo? I mean, uh, as you said, nobody really pays attention to what's happening in the house. So uh, she's been a controversial figure uh, among certain circles because she was an opposition politician uh, just uh, a few months ago, or last year rather. And now she has been defending both the Maharlika Investment Fund and also Vice President Sara Duterte's Confidential Funds. Um, she said that she's actually thinking of running for mayor in the next election to succeed the current mayor of Marikina. This positioning, this defense of the Maharlika Fund and then of uh, Sara Duterte's confidential funds, will it hurt her if she ran for mayor? Or will it hurt her if she changed her mind and decided to run for, let's say, Senate? It won't hurt her, won't hurt her at all mm -hmm. because the issues in Marikina are local issues. Okay. So it won't hurt her one bit. Not one bit. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, uh, she's come down a lot because from being a principal player, mm -hmm. she turned around and then supported the, uh, the Maharlika bill. And, and I, I don't agree with that. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I think that she made a mistake. Thank you. Sir, uh, former Undersecretary Shello Magno, right? Uh, very few people know her uh, outside you know, the circles of power. But uh, she was uh, removed from office because she criticized the uh, price ceiling on rice, right? Um, I was struck by the uh, conflicting views about her uh, outspokenness. Some people welcomed it and said, uh, that's right, she should have uh, spoken what was her true feelings and then resigned. But some people have also criticized her for criticizing the administration while she was still a part of it. My question for you, sir, is itong ganitong klaseng political behavior, may, may relevance ba for you know, the masa uh, voter? Uh, ang tingin ba nila, trinaydor yung administration? Or they don't even think about this? You know, the masa doesn't pay attention to these things. It's mm -hmm. us, the intelligent ones and the ones in Manila where, where we pay attention to it. And uh, Miss Magno was very, very sharp in pointing out that the law of supply and demand, mm -hmm. still the law of supply and demand, no matter how many times you try to repeal it. That's right. And, and because she said that, she was fired. And she was fired in a most this way, you know, they just said you're fired, and uh, that that's not good. Now, does the masa hear that? No, the masa doesn't hear that. The masa doesn't hear about these things. But to us, who are observers of the Philippine scene and the Manila scene, mm -hmm. uh, we admire Miss Miss Mag Magna for doing what she did. Thank you, sir. Sir, fourth out of uh, five personalities, Edsel Lagman. Ed, uh, Congressman Lagman uh, uh, famously defended uh, President GMA from her first impeachment uh, threat with his set of prejudicial questions. But over the years, he's uh, moved uh, left of center or leftward. Uh, now he's president of the Liberal Party. Um, where would you place uh, Congressman Lagman on the political spectrum and then in relation to the massa voter? Well, uh, I, no. not in relation to the massa voters. Mm -hmm. In just relation to the political spectrum, he's mm -hmm. left of center. Mm -hmm. 
it's not in relation to the mass of voters, but the mass of voters don't care whether you're right, left, or center. What does that's, the... that's, that's the truth. A mass mm -hmm. doesn't care whether you're left, right, or center. What do they care about, sir? So you said today one of the uh, main problems is inflation. So they, they care about high prices. Uh, okay. Does the basket of values change uh, over time? For instance, Duterte became president because people really thought there was a peace and order uh, threat. I don't understand again your question. Would you repeat that? Yeah, no problem at all, sir. So, so uh, you talked about the massa voter uh, not really paying attention to you know uh, political ideology or even particular positions. Uh, but you did say earlier that uh, we should pay attention to what they're saying about, for instance, inflation. So right now, the surveys say that's their most pressing. Uh, concern. Um, this, this basket of pressing concerns, um, do they change over time or do they remain the same, sir? It's always jobs, uh, inflation, and so on. It's the same. It's the same for the past 50 years. Jobs, inflation. And we have not done anything about it. Now, what happens next, I don't know. Sir, let, let me test your idea about the political center in, in, a, a, appealing to the mass of voter by taking a look at the uh, 2016 results. So Duterte won the presidency with a little over 39% of the vote. And he ran for office uh, based on a peace and, a peace and order uh, platform, uh, anti-drugs, anti-crime and so on. We, can we say that in 2016, that, new, that uh, new value was added to the basket, uh, peace and order? Or, yes. Or he, or he did not represent the political center at all? No, he, didn't. he, he was representing the political center, mm -hmm. which is peace and order. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you see, he, he became popular during his term. Because people could feel safely, could, could feel that they could safely walk home from work at the end of the day. Because there were no people stand by in the gangs and doing that. Mm -hmm. That was very, very big. That was very big in, 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 in the, the Duterte Plus. So it was a, it, it was a center, but it, it had nothing to do with but nobody else was trying to solve it. Nobody was trying to solve the jobs problem. Nobody mm -hmm. was trying to solve the inflation problem. Mm -hmm. But the peace and order problem, Duterte solved it temporarily. Last uh, personality, uh, sir. Um, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. <laughs> you said earlier that uh, maybe that is where the political center is today. If you define the political center as that's where most of the massa voters are. Is Marcos and, the political center? No, Marcos is not in the political center. Nobody is. That's, that, that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody is outside the political center, and so it's choosing who you just want to be with because you're, they're not really paying attention to your problem. Mm -hmm. You know, put it this way. If you were really paying attention to, to the problem, he would not repeal the law of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. That was the, that's the most stupid thing I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and he's going to have to live that down. And then so things are going to get worse for him. And so his, his, his uh, ratings are going to start dropping. So are you saying he's part of the political center? He's not. As a matter of fact, this is the, this, the, the political center is what is bringing him down. So can we make a distinction, sir, between the political center defined as the mass voter uh, during election time 
and in between elections. So in no. 2022, uh, a year and a few months ago, uh, he was able to tap or appeal to the political center. Uh, and we had a majority mandate for the first time in 36 years. Uh, but right now, while governing, uh, he has obviously lost some support. Uh, so he would not be appealing to the political center. Is, can we make those distinctions, sir? Uh, election time oh. and in between elections? Oh, no, he, he did not appeal to the political center. Marcos had 33% of the vote. Sarah had another 33% of the vote. Mm -hmm. Together, they got 66% or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Sarah's vote came from her father, not because of her. Mm -hmm. All right? It came from the father. So, having said that, they both won. Uh, what you want to call it? Lenny only got about 30% of the vote. But still, that is not the center. Just because they won, that's not the center of the, the, the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody else had come in and talked about the inflation and talked about uh, jobs, they would be thrown out the window. But nobody was doing that. So, eh, 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 Everybody was uh, just saying their own thing. Even Marcos didn't did make any promises during the campaign. Well, he except didn't make any, he didn't make any promises, except for the twenty peso rise uh, and also the general sense of unity. This this appeal yeah. to unity, I thought the, the the twenty peso rise hit the inflation problem on the head. Let's see it. <laughs> He couldn't deliver. Why? Because it's impossible to deliver 30 peso rice. Mm -hmm. Maybe 30, uh, 30 peso rice, puede, but not 20 peso rice. Sir, how can we improve our democracy then? Uh, if the same problems uh, remain the last 50 years, so there's no real progress well, there. Um, what, you're doing, what you're doing is a good thing. We just keep on debating this until we can find a way to bring our ideas together. Uh, it's difficult in this country because people say one thing and then when they get to Congress, they do another thing. So how on earth are you going to be able to fill the, fulfill the promises you made mm -hmm. because they're doing other things? Uh, we had to get rid of Congress. But that's impossible. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know the answer to that now at, at, at this time. Okay. Do you think that as a constituency, sir, uh, abol uh, abolition of Congress, do you, think, <laughs> do you think that will appeal to the Filipino voter? <laughs> Polish Congress? Yeah. Do you think? Yeah, I, I think if somebody stands up and says, that's just a Polish Congress, I, I, I think uh, about... 50, 60 percent will agree with that. <laughs> so, wait, look, mm -hmm. hati -hati nila yung pork barrel mm -hmm. The pork barrel is about 10 to 20 percent of our our uh, the, the the budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, out, uh, out of that, the the congressmen divide about. 800 billion pesos among themselves, divided by. Mm -hmm. they, they each make, uh, how much they make? Was that they, they, they make a lot of money. They, they make about 200, 300 million pesos out of their kickbacks from the pork bottom. Mm -hmm. So they'll always behave themselves. When you have a Maharlika bill, Approve kagad yan. When you have a... Because hawak, hawak ng presidente. The president controls Congress because of the pork barrel. That has been true since my grandfather's time mm -hmm. in 1923 when he was speaker. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, you can always tell where Congress would go because that's where the pork barrel goes. Mm -hmm. 
Now, remember, I'll tell you something, and people don't listen to me because of this, but remember, Joe de Venecia was speaker for, mm -hmm. I don't know, terms, five terms, six terms. Mm -hmm. Akala nila, hawak ni Joe de Venecia yung Congress. Okay? Mm -hmm. Stan came out and testified against Mike Arroyo. And Gloria just gave the order quietly, changed Joe de Venecia. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Senate, the reporters were all coming to me and they said, Sir, ilang boto makukuha ni Joe de Venecia? Take one. I said, you can count on your two fingers the amount of votes he'll get. They said, the Sir, hindi pwede yan. Mm -hmm. No, nope. you cannot, you cannot say that. You can count on your two fingers the amount of votes you will get. He got six. <laughs> he lost the speakership to uh, Nogi Nograles. That's right. Mm -hmm. But that's because he crossed Gloria, that's all. In other words, the president controls Congress. And right now, the president even controls the Senate. So it's useless to be there. Is it in so, fact? So <laughs> is it in fact useless, yeah. sir? <laughs> uh, you you spoke, for instance, of the work, uh, the fantastic work of Risa Ontiveros. She's in the Senate. I, we need her there. Um, yeah, but she's alone. Yeah, one. Yeah, one, one of uh, minority of two. Um, so, sir, um, we've been talking essentially of the elitist nature of our politics, which, but which is determined by an appeal to the massa voter. Essentially, that's it. So you have somebody like Robin Padilla, who is part of the elite because of his popularity through entertainment, his, his uh, decades of work in show business. He's part of the elite, even if maybe some intellectuals will not classify him as elite because you know, he didn't go to the right schools and that sort of thing. But in terms of power, He's part of the elite. And then he appeals to the massa voter. So essentially, that's the formula. You get celebrity, and then you somehow appeal to the massa voter by pushing some of the buttons involving inflation, peace and order, jobs. That's a very bleak <laughs> description of our current political system. Sir, I know it's, it's very a... Weak. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sir. Because we have never, never, ever come together and say, this is where we will be, and this is where we're going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. In other words, we'll, we will be here today, but tomorrow is another thing, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's always like that, that the, 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 the electorate has gotten used to that already. Mm -hmm. Now, there are Election to, to, to the Senate is a, uh, is, is a rather very painful process. Mm -hmm. Before, the Senate was elected by groups. So That's you right. had liberal and groups. No? That's right. So the liberals nominated eight senators, mm -hmm. and the nationalists nominated eight senators. That's right. Eight senators nominated by the liberals were more or less chosen, particularly for their balance, for their whatnot. That's right. And, ah, but when, in 1959, when Rogelio de la Rosa ran for the Senate mm -hmm. as an independent mm -hmm. and won, that changed the, <laughs> the Senate structure. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon people say, oh, I don't need the, uh, you don't need the party. I just need to be able to appeal to the, to, to, to the voters. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it started from there. And so right right now, there's nothing that, that you can do about the Senate because uh, before, when people were chosen on the basis of their, their ability, mm -hmm. now anybody who wants to run can just go on, on, on TV and say, oh, by the way, I, I, I played the... Uh, so and so in this movie, mm -hmm. and then so I'm going to be like that guy. Uh, it's it's a really a very difficult situation for us because we have to 
restructure the way the Senate is. The, the, the Senate would be better if there were 15, say, 15 or 16 regions mm. and three per region. Okay. So, so, so at, at least the person has to come from that region and pay attention to that region and campaign for that region. But on a national scale, you cannot really campaign for, for the Senate. It's just popularity. It's very difficult to campaign for the Senate because this is such a big country with 110 mm -hmm. million votes. It's impossible. So you just have to be popular and you have to have gimmicks. But that is not the way to elect a good man. Mm -hmm. huh? Yes, sir. Uh, maybe just one last question. We're running long, but uh, I wanted to bring in into the discussion Something I learned from the polit two political scientists I interviewed last uh, week. Uh, they're the department chairs of political science in both UP and Ateneo. And they both had the same idea that given today's political realities, we should redefine the political center as a pro-democratic plurality. Meaning, it might be a small segment of the population, but this is the segment of the electorate that supports reform. Uh, for instance, anti-dynasty, uh, anti anti-corruption, uh, that, that's, that sort of thing. So they, they, they think that that is the way to go forward. Sir, uh, as a politician and knowing many other politicians uh, with a much more pragmatic view of how it really happens in the Philippines, is there any chance at all that a political center like this, like an aspirational center, you know, puro mga reformists and so on, can actually uh, take off? No, I, I, I don't think, on, on, you, on what you said on that basis, uh, I don't think a center will actually take off. The center must come from where it actually is, which is inflation and jobs. And if, when you get that, if you can capture that, then you're going. Then then you're on your way to victory. But aside from that, it just so that's a too big. Hmm. You know, you just uh, go out there and say something, and then if it doesn't work, oh, you say another thing. If it doesn't work, you say another thing, and it, it, it's got nothing to do with belief, but. Unfortunately, that's the way our, our, our country has developed and, uh, and that's the way we will be until somebody finds the solution that you're looking for. Thank you, Senator Serge. This was a deeply informative and also thought-provoking conversation. Uh, I see now why even today many politicians continue to go to you for election advice. Uh, just the facts. <laughs> Again, many thanks, Senator Serge. Thank you. Our search for the political center in the Philippines, has it all been a fool's errand? Or, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Our search for the political center in the Philippines, has it all been a fool's errand? Or is there a real value to the answer? In the context of Rodrigo Duterte's transformation of the Philippines and the rehabilitation of the Marcoses, I would like to think that the answer is that the center is, well, central to the democratic project. We have seen Ferdinand Marcos apply Richard Nixon's influential concept of the so-called silent majority to martial law Philippines. Does that invalidate the concept? Or does it mean instead that we should work to make sure that democracy appeals to the majority, whether silent or loud? We have also seen the appeal of an aspirational definition of the center as a pro-reform, anti-dynasty, anti-corruption, plurality. Does this undermine the role of a majority in a democracy? Or does it mean instead that we, sh that we should work to create a wider mandate for reform? And we have just seen the just the facts appeal of a pragmatic view of politics, identifying the center with gut issues that affect the poor voter. Does this privilege elite politics and the politics of popularity? Or does this mean instead that any attempt to raise the quality of our democracy 
must always start from the most basic of the voters' needs. The search for the center must continue. But as always, the next step for engaged citizens is to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night. Thank you.